Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. This year I'm committing to doing a video a month at least, uh, which is going to be sort of a wrap up uh, thing of that month. So it'll just contain all the books I've read that month. I haven't done a video on the channel in like seven months, maybe eight months. And I did one just before New Year's with all of the books I'd read up until then. It was like 40 books long and yeah, just a bit of a behemoth. So I haven't gotten around to fully editing that yet, but it will be up on the channel at some point. But for now, let's focus on January. Uh, my reading goal this year is 50 books as it has been for the past couple of years, but like internally, I really want to read 100 books, but I'm afraid of putting that down anywhere like on my Goodreads because then it'll get halfway through the year and I'll fall off reading and then I'll be like, ah! You know, it's easy to say when you're on track in January, less easy to say when you're not on track in October. So far, I'm on track. I have read nine books this month and I'm going to talk to you about each of them. So let's get started. The first book, I guess this is kind of cheating because I read it like mostly last year, um, is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. This is a token classic. It was first published in 1868. It follows four sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. Um, they're all about a year apart. I think at the start of the story, Meg is 16. Uh, and it's actually split into two books, but then they're published in one vol volume. So it is Little Women and Good Wives. Uh, so there's like a maybe five year jump in between them. So yeah, it's just like these, these four sisters, their family is like not very wealthy. They kind of get by. They make friends with their neighbor, Laurie, and his grandfather, which is really cute. Each chapter is kind of a little adventure in its own. Um, you know, it's one of the daughters dealing with a crisis or like them as a family having a problem or some event happening, um, which is kind of cute. It feels very serialized uh, and it was enjoyable. It's obviously good writing, but I found it just like so domestic and so virtuous. Like at the very start, the mother gives a copy to each of the girls of the Pilgrim's Progress. And you know, like every now and then they're like, oh yes, we, pro we, we said we're gonna be really good and virtuous. So like, let's, we need to act like that. You know, and it's very, I don't, they're not really very bad ever, and that's, it's kind of frustrating, it's a bit too perfect. There was one chapter, however, that I absolutely adored. It's called Heartache, it's about two, three quarters of the way through the book, and uh, I don't want to spoil it. I mean, can you spoil it? It's been out for 150 years. Um, oh, it's been out for 150 years, like last year. Ah, oh, that's a good time for me to read it. Heartache is about unrequited love from someone that loves you in a familial way, you know? And it's just like, oh, but, why won't you just like be with me? We're obviously perfect for each other. It's like, I know we're perfect for each other, but like I have to be the strong one to, and say no because it's not quite right. And I'm doing it for the both of us, even though it's really painful. And it was just fabulous. The next book I read is Everything I Never Told You by Celeste Ng. This was published in 2014. I read the uh, her other book, uh, was it Little Fires Everywhere, which was a more recent one. I read that um, the other month and I really liked it, so I did some more of the same thing. So this uh, takes place in small town Ohio in the 70s. It's about a Chinese American family. Um, and the very start, literally the first three words are, Lydia is dead. Lydia is dead, but they don't know this yet. So it is the middle child in this family who just disappears one day and then they find her at the bottom of the village lake. And the whole book is about the rest of the family kind of coming to terms with that death. Uh, after it's kind of established there isn't any foul play, everyone's kind of grappling with why would she want to kill herself or like what other things could have happened to have led up to this event. And each of the different members of the family recalling different uh, moments leading up to it. And it's really, it was really enjoyable read, but it did kind of drive me nuts because it was just like every person just needed to talk all of them had these moments in their past that kind of dictated their actions and their personality, their whole character for like the rest of time and their relationship with the other characters. And it's everyone just needed to kind of get over themselves and then it went, nothing would have gone wrong. <laughs> um, but I did the climax, like toward the end of the book, it was just really, really delectable reading. Um, I did enjoy it a lot and will definitely be following more of Celestine's writings um, as they come out in the future. The next book I have, I don't actually have anymore because I immediately lent it to someone else to read because it's the kind of book that you're like, please everyone consume this. It is written by Hans Rowling, but also with the help of his son and daughter-in-law or daughter and son-in-law, oh, not sure which around, um, Ola and Anna. Unfortunately, Hans had a, like rapid medical decline and I think the book was published slightly after his death um, last year. So this book starts out with a quiz and it's 12 questions. I think maybe it's 13 questions. Whatever, let's just stick with the 12. Uh, 12 questions about global economic 
trends, so like health and education, population growth, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it gives you the answers at the end. And I got a nine out of 12 and I was like, that's, that's pretty good. And then the, after that, he's like, the average person gets two out of 12. And, and that's not just like a, a Joe on the street. It's like in every country, in every industry, even like people that you'd expect to know the facts about these things, the average was still less than a, a monkey randomly doing it. His thesis was basically, everyone thinks that the world is going to shit and, and it's really not. Like there are so many things in the world that are getting better. One thing he talks about heavily is us kind of labeling countries as like low income or third world or that kind of thing. He instead splits it into four categories based on um, like income per day and it's exponential. So it's not just like zero to 20 pounds, 20 to 40, 40. it's like $2, $8, $16, $64 or something like that. Um, because obviously like one dollar $1 is going to be worth a lot more to someone that only has one dollar a day uh, compared to someone that has a bunch. The book is structured along the lines of sort of digital literacy I suppose. Each chapter is one way in which you may be interpreting data wrong. So like um, having a bias towards things continuing the same or having a bias towards things continue in a straight line. Things like grouping, things like only ever paying attention to the most horrible statistic, uh, things like, you know, media, sway. I wish I had it in front of me to tell you the actual chapter names, because I feel like that would be a lot more evocative. It was a really great book. I didn't particularly enjoy the structure of, you know, this is a way that you're interpreting data wrong, um, but it had a load of interesting anecdotes and, you know, hardcore facts. And it just gives you a lot more context for how the world is happening on like a, a more macro scale that I think everyone needs to have more of a perspective from. Um, so we'd definitely recommend that if you are interested in global trends or just having a well-rounded, open view of the world as it progresses. The next book I read was the only audiobook I read this month, which is surprising for me, um, and that is Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, this was published in 2009. It is a standalone uh, within the Cosmere universe, but there's an upcoming sequel, so that'll be interesting. Uh, Bran Sanson is like a juggernaut of fantasy. I feel like everyone's pinning their hopes on him as being like, you know, the the only young, extremely prolific and very popular fantasy writer. I've always wanted to get into his stuff, but when it comes to large, long fantasy, I prefer to listen to the audiobooks, but almost all of his books are narrated by quite an American man. I just don't like listening to very American sounding audiobook narrators, I'm sorry. But this one, luckily, because the protagonists are female, it is voiced by a female narrator and I enjoy the voice. It is important to like the voice of the audiobooks you're listening to, because otherwise it just taints the story for me. And also this as a standalone, I feel, is a good way to get into that world because you're not burdened by there being like so much more content after it. So it follows two princesses. Um, I don't have any of the details in front of me, so I'm not going to remember the names of any of these things. Uh, but basically one of the princesses uh, in their little kingdom was betrothed to the, like, the god, um, which is a, a like, neighbouring kingdom, but their, their god is in charge, like, they have actual human gods, uh, kind of. They're like, un they've been brought back from the dead. It's a whole thing. But basically, one of these princes, a princess is betrothed her, um, betrothed to him, and then the king is just like, actually, I'm gonna send my other daughter. Um, and this one daughter has been preparing for this their whole lives, they know all of the customs, and this, and the other one is just kind of like a bit of a gad, like likes having fun and not having many responsibilities, and then she's suddenly thrust in this, this place. There are greater political implications for like the world at large but then you also see the um you know individual games going on uh that's a shit description it was a fun book if you also want to get into brown and samson but don't really know where to start try this and if you like it then go on and i will go on i'm just trying to read a hundred books this year i can't read like a thousand page novel i can i can and i will uh but yeah not in that much of a hurry for it the next book I have is Mr. Penumbra's 24 Hour Bookstore by Robin Sloan. I read Robin Sloan's other novel, Sourdough, around the same time last year. This came out before though, this came out in 2012. So Robin, Robin Sloan's whole thing is, is taking like the tech scene in San Francisco and then like adding in with a sprinkle of stardust something else he enjoys and just like turning it into a bit of a romp. So Sourdough was that plus 
baking. Um, and then this is that plus books. Um, so it follows this guy called Clay who uh, starts working, who's a designer, and then he starts working, he's like out of work, he starts working in a 24 hour bookstore in the sort of night shift. Um, and he starts noticing it's really weird. It's like not much of a bookshop, but then there's also this like very strange vertical library at the back and people come in and swap, like have some secret passcode and have to swap a book with something else. And he was like, something more is going on here. So as it progresses, you get more insight into this cult essentially, that's trying to find um, the answer to immortality, but also it's to do with like a, a printer from the 1500s and like a really famous typesetter and it's just like it's so Robin Sloan uh, and it was great fun there were a couple bits that didn't really make sense to me narratively um, and you know there's not like a lot of character progression or any of that kind of thing but it's a really like it was a really enjoyable read. The next book I have is The Walled City by Rowan Grouding. <laughs> Ryan Grouding. why can't I say this name? Uh, so this is a YA novel that I don't have a lot of interest in, but I love the setting for it and that's why I decided to read it. So there was this thing um, called the Kowloon Walled City, uh, which was is an area inside of Hong Kong that became an enclave in the like early 1900s uh, when the British took over Hong Kong. And basically, because it's like this has this kind of like weird political status, became this area that um, by the time it was torn down in the early 90s, had 50,000 people living within like six, 6.4 acres, right? So it's an extremely dense place. It used to be a Chinese fort and um, it's, you know, like 10 stories high, extremely densely packed and then rampant with like crime, prostitution, drugs, violence. It's like just fascinating. So this real crazy how did this ever exist place, there was a fascinating episode on 99% Invisible, a design podcast that I will link down below. Um, and this is set in a fictionalized world that is equivalent of Kowloon World City. So I wanted to read it just to like get an insight into what that kind of area could be like. This follows three characters. Uh, Mei Yi has been sold by her like abusive father um, from like a small farming uh, village into prostitution and her sister Jin Lee uh, follows her to the city to try and kind of like find her and get her out of the situation. We also have this other character called Dai who is a quite a mysterious man like figure in the, in the city who employs Jin Ling who is by the way pretending to be a boy um, as a, a kind of like a drug runner uh, but he has his own issues. Uh, I didn't like it was it was a fine story. It was fairly predictable. It was quite gripping, but also not like the best written literature ever. Um, but like just the setting of the Walled City is just so fascinating. Um, so if you are as intrigued by that as I was, then you should pick this one up. Have I mentioned that I've had a very varied reading month? Um, the next book I read was Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Um, this is like something. Um, in, t in like the world of science fiction, if you think of the biggest hits, you have the Foundation series, you have Dune, and then I guess you have like Brave New World, but that's, this is like at the very top. Um, and this is the, the main, there, I think there were a couple books before this in the world of Foundation, but this was like the first book of the Foundation trilogy, and then there's like a whole bunch of books after that. So this was published in 1950, 51, 52, and it takes place in some sort of distant future where humans have occupied basically any livable planet in the whole everywhere. At the start of this there is the Galactic Empire, which is kind of the governing body for the whole universe, and it's been going strong for 12,000 years, um, but it is starting to crumble. So there is this man called Harry Seldon, I'm just gonna hold my tea. There's this man called Harry Seldon who is a psycho historian, who knows what that really means, but basically he can kind of predict the future, um, not def not definitively, but just kind of with a high prob probability predict the future kind of like economically uh, based on historical factors. So he kind of realizes that this whole thing is crumbling and um, sets up this kind of like science haven planet on the far outer reaches um, that isn't really going to be affected by anything that happens but can also carry all of that the knowledge of the current prosperity into the future in a couple thousand years time so he's got like a, a long game plan um, and that's cool 
but the thing is every like 50 pages in this book, I think there were like four time jumps and it would just jump forward a couple of generations of them being on this, this planet um, when they're faced with another difficult thing, like a difficult political thing with surrounding planets and surrounding kingdoms. In one instance, they kind of use religion as a way to um, keep themselves uh, untouchable and then they also use trade as a way to do that. The universal implications of what was happening in this book were really fascinating but like page to page I didn't find it very interesting at all especially because you got like a whole new set of characters every now and then and it's always like one cunning slimy man that actually like is thinking about it in a way that no one else is that manages like to turn the tables and then he's suddenly the ruler um, and yeah a lot of that and I am not going to be continuing to read the rest of the Foundation series. I'm glad that I read this one because uh, I think it's good to, it's good to like, you know, know what it's about, even if I'm not going to fully invest in it. Um, and I can see how this would be so addictive. If you were like into this and there's, there's a lot more of it, you can know the whole history of this empire and what happens. Because so, he, he doesn't have, you know, this, it, it starts out saying the Galactic Empire has been in power for 12,000 years. You're like, that's a long time. And then this gets to go thousands of years into the future. There's so much potential in there. Um, but yeah, not really for me. The next book I read is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. Uh, this came out last year and I don't remember how I found out about it, but I read the blurb and I was like, that's fascinating to me. This story takes place in a forest in Northumberland and uh, it's this 17 year old, 17 ish year old girl, Sylvie, um, and both of her parents are joining a archaeology professor and three of his students um, living out what it would have been like for Iron Age Britons 2,000 years ago at the time uh, just in this forest over their summer holidays. Sylvie doesn't get a vote on what's happening so she's just thrust into this uh, like they're in this dark hut thing and they have to go and forage all the food themselves um, and also her dad and the professor are wanting to um, experiment with other things that, that like the kind of rituals that happened at the time uh and that sort of thing and it was very dark um his father is very abusive uh both physically and emotionally um to sylvie and her mother so she is very downtrodden uh by by her father the book felt so dark to me it wasn't specifically it was it was dark you have the the twofold of it being a very abusive man and then also a feeling sort of like naked to the idea that they don't have any of these modern conveniences and they have to be all communications and they're just this I think this did take place in like the 80s I feel maybe the 70s there is something that marks the time so they wouldn't have had like iPhones anyway outside of that but um it's something just very much like you don't even have a community she just has these these other out of the three students one of them is a girl and it takes interest in her and they kind of strike up a friendship uh but she doesn't have anyone protecting her um and it's really painful like it, i found it quite scary at times it's not a scary book but it's just you can feel you can feel how bad the situation is um and that's quite quite horrible it's very short it's only like 150 pages or something like that um and i think like when I started reading it, I just I was just kind of over stories of abuse. I feel like all I hear is stories about horrible, horrible men. And although that hasn't really been reflected in the books I've read this month, um, definitely some of the books I read to the end of last year and a lot of podcasts I listen to and that kind of thing, it's just such a prevailing narrative that I, I'm still so angry about it. And it just like gets my anger back up and it's not helpful to me anymore. So I don't want to read any more stories that have really abusive men in them because uh, it's just... It's just dampening my spirit um but yeah this was a i can't even say whether i liked it or not like there are some things i really liked it i don't know it's it's a it's a really hard one you know uh yeah i guess i'll i'll leave it at that on a final note and i'm glad this is our final note um this is a triv by ellie williams this is i haven't finished reading this yet i'm only about two thirds of the way through but it's a short story collection so i feel like i can talk about it put the tea down so i can read some bits so uh, yes, short story collection, mostly around language and communication. So I, the first story in it just stole my heart. It absolutely took my breath away. It's called The Alphabet or Love Letters or Writing Love Letters Before I Forget How to Use Them or These Miserable Loops Look So Much Better on Paper Than in Practice. So it is 
uh, a first-hand account of a it's a love story uh, with of a woman that has aphasia. So throughout the story, she's losing language and the ability to express herself, uh, and it's kind of like erratic and and it trips through a lot of words. Not not it's not like illegible at all. That's not what I mean. It doesn't actually lose words in the way in the way it's actually written, but you can feel her grasping at things and grasping at this love and it's just oh just delightful and I kind of I finished that um short story and I was like this is like it's if Salinger cared a lot about writing Salinger is one of my favorite short story writers I absolutely love his short stories and there's something just really evocative about the way he uses the way he uses kind of like the gaps between languages and the things that aren't said um it and it leaves them to be filled in and it works so well I don't I don't know how I feel like I'm not describing that very well, um, but this has that same sense, uh, but it is like channeled through this idea of talking about words. So there's a story about, you know, a, someone that really wanted to kiss someone else in an art gallery and couldn't find that. Um, there's a story about a, a synesthete, someone that has like just really disconnected um, senses in her brain with words and I, just it's a shame that the first one was just so incredible because that's like then I read the second one I was like oh it's just like a good short story collection instead of the most amazing thing I've ever read <laughs> um but I am really enjoying these I'm usually I am a one book at a time person I power through stuff and this has been on my bedside table for a week and I really love just reading one story at a time and taking it in um I've liked this a lot so far <laughs> and I'm gonna really enjoy the last couple of stories as well Woo! We did it! We did it, folks! That is nine books um, that I have talked about for the month of January. And it's only the 27th, so who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of days, but we'll catch that in February. I will try and put the really long... Uh, the thing is, I've made that really long book video, and then I saw a bunch of people's like top books from 2018, and I was like, oh, I've just made this absolute load of crap about 40 books, and other people have been really eloquent and decisive about you know, picking four or five books from the year that they really enjoyed. And I was like, I don't, I'm not, I'm just like word spilling and not really providing much specific value on each of them. But the goal of this channel is to talk about every book. So I feel it would be a disservice if I didn't include it. So I'm going to. Oh, anyway, tell me, what's the best book that you've read this year so far? I mean, you've probably only read like two, um, because it is January, but we have a long time to go. Does anyone else also have really ambitious reading goals and how are you feeling about them so far? I'd love to hear that. Um, I'll catch you in the comments and I will see you next month. Bye.